Thanksgiving is this week. The next day is uh, Black Friday. Isn't that amazing in our culture? What we do, we go from one day being thankful for everything we have to the very next day obsessing over everything we want. So amazing how we do that. But uh, <sighs> that kind of leads me into what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, subject for today. Um, I've got just a simple message for us this morning. What I'm going to share today is probably not revolutionary. You've probably all heard it before, but some of you um, have requested a nice simple message after last week's beating. I mean conviction. I mean after last week's sermon. So, um, But we're going to continue in our series Inside Out, and we've been focusing on some different characteristics, some different virtues that we want to develop on the inside of us. These are some things we feel like are uh, core values are essential to us as a church family. These are some things we want to be true of us as individuals, as a church family. And what's wonderful is as God develops these things on the inside of us, hopefully they are evident to the people around us on the outside of us. So what he does inside hopefully is evident on the outside. And like I said at the beginning of this series, it's not just about behavior modification. No, this is about heart transformation. We want, this, we want the Holy Spirit to work on the inside of us. And uh, this has turned out to be one of the longer sermon, sermon series, series of sermons. Um, we started this way back at the beginning of September, and so far we've talked about courage and character and compassion and integrity, obedience and excellence. And today, this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we're going to turn our attention to the subject of gratitude. I want us to be thankful, grateful people. I want that to be true of us. That's a virtue I want to be true of us, that we are full of gratitude, that we live lives of gratitude. Released in 2017, there was a large research project that took about three years and $5.6 million to complete. It was done by the John Templeton Foundation, and it was about gratitude in our nation. They called it the science of gratitude. And they were researching things like, what exactly is gratitude? Where does it come from? Is there ways that we can foster more feelings and expressions of gratitude? And here's something I found interesting in this study, uh, this uh, $5.6 million study, is they discovered that 90% of Americans describe themselves as grateful people. And 90% of Americans believe that grateful people live more fulfilled, better lives, and have more friends. 95% of Americans believe that parents should teach their children to be thankful. 94% of Americans believe that grateful bosses are more successful in the workplace. But now here's the kicker. This is where it gets really interesting to me. Only half of people surveyed said they regularly participate in acts of gratitude. Oh, only half. And this is even better yet. Only 10% of people demonstrate gratitude in their workplace. 10%. So that means, let me just make sure this is clear. That means in America, we value gratitude. We celebrate gratitude. We teach it to our kids. We want it from our bosses. We even think that we are grateful people. But research has so shown that most of us struggle to express gratitude. Isn't that interesting? And that's what I want to talk about this morning, is this idea of gratitude. But I specifically want us to, to shed a little light on something I'm calling the gratitude gap. The gratitude gap. I want to bring some awareness to this, because I want us as a church family, again, I've said this already, to be grateful people. But I don't want us just to feel it, but I want us to express it. And so if you're taking notes... Here's some blanks to fill in here. Write this down. The gratitude gap is the space between gratitude felt and gratitude expressed. It's the space, it's that disparity between gratitude felt and gratitude expressed. You know, the, the gratitude gap is why parents have this one practice that they do with their kids. Like since the beginning of time, since there was parents and there was kids, there's this one question that parents ask of their kids. Anytime their kids are, um, you know, uh, given something or, 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 or a favor is done for their kids, parents say, they look over at their kid and they have this four-word four question they ask our kids. We ask our kids, kids, anybody have any idea what I'm thinking about this four-word? What do you say? Yeah, what do you say? And... And, and hopefully, hopefully, how children respond to that is they say two words, thank you, right? And that's what we want, right? We want our kids to, to say thank you when somebody does something for them, or we, we want them to say thank you. Why is that? Well, you know, it's just the right thing to do as a human being, right? You should be thankful. And 
you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when your kids actually say those two words, thank you, without being prompted, and they just say thank you when someone does something for them, it's like a, a parenting touchdown, isn't it? It's like, wow, we're doing something right. Like, I can't believe it. They actually said thank you without having to be prompted. But, but the reason that we, we ask our kids, we prompt our kids with that forward question of what do you say is, yes, we want them to say thank you, but probably more than anything, we want them to develop a, a heart of gratitude. We, we want that to be part of who they are. We want them to be thankful. And so, so I, today, I want to help us. I want to help us close that gap in our lives. I don't, want, I don't want people to have to say to us, well, what do you say? No, I want us just to, to know we need to be thankful. We need to say thank you. And so I want to look at this fascinating story. It's a fairly familiar story. It's found in Luke 17. And let's just read through this. Starting in verse 11, the word of God says this. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called, called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, I just want to pause right here because, you know, as we read the Bible, a lot of times we just kind of zip over things. We zip over important details. Sometimes we, we don't really think about the implications of the things that we read in the Bible. Sometimes things jump out to us, but sometimes we just zip over things. And something I want to make sure we don't zip over in this passage is this, is this, this word leprosy or, or the lepers here. Because we can zip over that, but I want you to, let's just express what this is. I, I, I encourage you to, to understand what this is because this is, uh, this is pretty important. So let me tell you about this a little bit. In Jesus' day, that word leprosy would have caused fear to rise up or, 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 or stir up the same kind of horror as the word Ebola today. You know, it's just like you hear that, you're like, oh, you know, that, that doesn't sound good. It was a horrible, horrible disease. It was a nightmare for those who had it. You see, if you got this disease, it would start by just pain in your joints, and then it would go to lumps on your skin and on your hands and your face, your cheeks, your nose, your lips. It eventually would cause a person to be unrecognizable. That's what leprosy would do. Sores would break out all over your body. They were painful. They looked awful, but they also had a, a horrible stench to them. It's called often death by inches because over time, the person's body would erode away. You know, they'd start losing fingers and toes and noses, death by inches. Again, it was this horrible, horrible disease. Besides the physical effect, there was this moral stigma, too, that was attached to this because it was believed that the cause of this disease is a person's sin. And so this person with the sickness would be required by law to, to tear their clothes as a sign of having this disease, and people would have to stay away from them, and they would have to stay away from people. And when anyone got close, they would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, and they would have to keep their distance. It was required by law. And so they're living in isolation. They, no one would ever shake their hand again. No one would hug them again, never to be touched again. So I just want you to imagine, yes, there is this horrible physical pain, but there's this emotional pain, too, that comes with this disease. And that's what's going on with these 10 people here. They're hurting. They're desperate. But this day they see Jesus and they cry out, Master, have pity on us. Now, normally, <laughs> others would just avoid these people, but not Jesus. Jesus had compassion on them. Uh, several weeks ago, we talked about compassion, and we talked about another incident where Jesus had compassion on someone with leprosy. And so let's see what happens in this story. Verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, this is interesting. Jesus sent them away to see a priest. Well, what's going on here? Well, Again, just giving you a little understanding of the culture at this time, it was required by law for a priest to verify the healing of a leper. They, before they could resume their normal life, they had to be declared clean before they could you know, go back to their homes and their work and their families and all those kind of things. And so Jesus, Jesus sent them to the priest to verify their healing. Now, just to be clear, he asked them to do this. He told them to do this even before they could see the effects of their healing. Okay, he, he asked them to do this, and you can almost think, well, maybe this is, this is like a test of their faith, isn't it? In essence, Jesus was saying, will you obey me even if there's no evidence of what I'm doing right now? And so these, these lepers did that. They took Jesus at his word, and as they're walking, something happens. That's what it says in verse 14. It says, as they went, they were healed, they were cleansed. And now, imagine, you know, they didn't have mirrors around, like they couldn't see this happening to themselves, right? But I'm sure they could see it on each other. 
Can you imagine how that was going? As they're taking steps, they start looking over at their buddy and they can start seeing things transform physically. They can see things happening. I, I, it's just amazing to think about that. I don't know how it happened, but that's how I imagine it happened. Every step, there was a new thing happening. The, the sores were going away. Things were going back. The, the, the stench was drifting away, right? Limbs were growing back. All these things were happening. I'm sure it was an awesome thing to see and experience. And I'm sure it caused them to celebrate a little bit, don't you? Running, jumping, maybe giving each other high fives because they finally had all five fingers back oh, too soon. Okay, never mind. Sorry. Just how my brain works sometimes. But there's this excitement. There's this celebration. And look what happens. Verse 15. One of them, when he, saw, when he saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Verse 17. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So, so how many were healed? Ten. How many came back to say thank you? One. Now, don't tell the John Templeton Foundation because they spent three years and $5.6 million to say something that Luke 17 has been saying all along that, that a lot of people may have gratitude. They may be grateful people, but we have a hard time expressing it. Hmm. There's a gap. And I'm sure if you ask those other nine, did they feel grateful? I'm sure they appreciated their healing. I'm sure they appreciated the miracle. They would say, yes, absolutely, we are grateful, but only one of them returned. And the truth is, there are many people across this world that feel gratitude, but only few, a few extraordinary people who actually return thanks, who give thanks. So unfortunately, there are very few who close the gap. But I don't want that to be true of us. I don't want that to be said of us. As followers of Christ, we are the ones that need to do our part to close the gap. I want it to be true of us that we would be grateful people to be those who don't just think about it or feel it on the inside, but actually express it and demonstrate it. So, so I want to use this passage a little bit. I just kind of want to walk through the story a little bit that we just read to give you four principles, four principles to close the gap, the gratitude gap, and I'll give you two practices. So four principles to know, two practices to do. So four principles, two practices. So here's number one. Here's number one principle. Gratitude gets noticed by God. Gratitude gets noticed by God. Did you guys pick this up in the story here? Jesus noticed when gratitude was present. He also noticed when gratitude was absent. Look at verse 17 again. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? The headline here is, God notices a grateful heart. God notices. Listen, when you say thank you, you have God's undivided attention. Thank you. Just ask yourself, what happens when you... When someone says thank you to you, what stirs in your heart when someone comes and says thanks or someone writes a note or sends you a card or sends you a text, doesn't it do something on the inside of you? Don't you, don't you just kind of feel good about that when someone appreciates what you've done or what you've said? And you know why? Well, I think part of the reason is because what it says in Genesis 126 where it says we are made in the image of God. God has placed a hint inside your heart of what he appreciates and what he desires from you. We are made in his image. But I just need to tell you something. God doesn't need, God doesn't need our thank yous. God doesn't need our appreciation. I mean, he wants it. He desires it. But it's not like God is sitting up in heaven with his arms crossed, you know, kind of pouting a little bit, waiting for us to say thank you. I don't think that's the case. He doesn't need our thankfulness, but he desires it. He wants it. He deserves it. You know something? I think one of the reasons he desires it is because he knows how much of a better person we are when we have a grateful heart. We're living at our finest when we express gratitude. The eyes of the Lord are searching for those whose hearts are full of gratitude and are willing to return thanks. So, so how do we do that? Well, if you're taking notes, I'm going to jump down to the, the second set of uh, fill-in-the-blanks there. So look down at the bottom. Here's some practices. Here's the first practice. I want to encourage you to do this. Develop a gratitude routine. A gratitude routine. Now, I don't know what that could mean for you, but if you need some ideas, let me just throw out a couple ideas. Here's one special one for you football fans. It's something I've called first and ten. Has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? So, so that means it's the first thing you do 
when you, when you get up, the first thing you could do is just write down 10 things that you're grateful for from the day before. So, so you just decide, okay, I'm going to start off my day by reflecting on the day before, thinking through the day before, and I'm going to come up with 10 things that I'm thankful for. And you take time to write those down, and then after you write those down, you think about those things. I mean, it couldn't take more than five to 10 minutes, I don't think. Then you just take a second and just thank God for those things. Now, I called it first and 10, has a nice ring to it, but maybe you want to end your day by doing that. So I don't know what you'd call that last and 10. It doesn't quite sound the same, so that's why I like first and 10. But, but the idea is the principle of just reflecting on the day. It could happen to get the end of the day, beginning of the day, but just reflecting on the day and just taking time to think, okay, about the blessings and the goodness of God and how it's been displayed in your life. Part of the gratitude routine that you could have. Another idea, another great exercise is just to be intentional in your prayer time. You know, it's easy when you, when you pray just to focus on your needs and your wants when you talk to God, but what if you intentionally spent time thanking God for what he has done or is doing in your life? Instead of just looking at your needs, what are some of the blessings you received? And I know some of you guys do this as parents. I, I've heard about you guys talk about this, how this is a practice with your children. At bedtime, when it's prayer time and you're asking your kids, do you have any prayer requests? You also ask, do you have anything you're thankful for? And it just helps your kids respond a little differently. It helps them think about God a little differently, how they engage with God. So it's not just coming to God with their needs, the things they're concerned about, but also taking time to say, God, I thank you for these things. It helps us, it helps us interact with God, how we see God. So let me ask you, how are you doing with your gratitude routine? Is thankfulness a regular part of your life? I don't know about you, but I want to be, about, I want to be like that one man who comes back to Jesus and says, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to do that every day. There's no end to the things that we can be thankful for, what God has done in our lives. And I'll just say it, as a follower of Jesus, Thanksgiving's not just one day a year. It should be an everyday thing that we do, right? Psalms 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And I know we've talked, to, talked about this before around here, but one way to interpret this is thanksgiving is a password to enter into the presence of God. Hmm. Access to the presence of God when we're thankful. God is looking for a grateful heart, and gratitude gets noticed by God. That leads me to my next point, back to the top set of fill in the blanks there. This is principle number two. Gratitude must be expressed to exist. Going back to that research project by the John Templeton Foundation, it's not a Christian organization, but they did mention God several times in their report because they talked about the fact that a huge part of gratitude is the fact that gratitude is an others-oriented emotion. In other words, you have to express it to someone to have it. If it's not expressed, does it really exist? You know, like the old adage, if a tree falls in the forest, does it really make a sound if no one's around to hear it? Right? I think it's kind of similar here. So gratitude is an others-oriented emotion. And this re report says it is not, if it's not expressed to a person, people can also express gratitude towards God, fate, nature, etc. I don't know about you. I've never thought about thanking a rock for something, but apparently that's what people can do, I guess. Anyways, but this passage here from Luke 17, we also see that, that gratitude must be expressed to exist. You know, I'm pretty sure, again, that those other men were, were thankful, they're grateful. I think they felt gratitude, but they didn't express their gratitude. Therefore, did it really exist? They didn't get credit for it. Authored, author uh, Howard Dayton says this in one of his books. This is very insightful. He says this, he says, let these next five words sink in and revolutionize the way you respond to God and others. Unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude. Let me read that again. Unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude. And then he says this as an example. He says, for example, a mother who works hours preparing Thanksgiving meal, her family devours the turkey and the trimmings in what seems like 45 seconds. Although they are grateful for the meal, they fail to say it. This unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude to the mother. She feels unappreciated and taken for granted. If you're married, one of the healthiest, healthiest, <laughs> He says, one of, the, one of the healthiest things you can do for your marriage is to regularly express gratitude, genuine gratitude to your spouse. So, so right after you lean over and say thank you to the person sitting next to you, maybe you need to write this down. Unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude. Hmm. Have you ever gone on your way to help somebody, serve somebody, give a gift to somebody, let somebody borrow something, and then... 
they never come back and tell you thank you. How does it make you feel? Well, it makes you feel like they're ungrateful. And you know what? A lot of times it's easier to see that in other people, you know, that ingratitude. It's easy to see that in other people, but sometimes we miss it in ourselves, right? Because, you know, we, we know the rest of the story. We know why we're not thankful or why we didn't get a chance to say thank you. But let me just remind you, unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude. So let me just ask you a few questions. If you're married, when was the last time you told your spouse thank you? You you took time to say thank you to them for working hard, providing for the family, taking care of the home, for the sacrifices they made for the family. You've said thank you. If you're a son or daughter, when was the last time you told your parents thank you? Expressed your gratitude for what they do for you, to care and provide for you, to protect and support you. This is powerful. Saying thank you is powerful, guys. I hope you guys understand this. And it could be the simplest thing you could ever do to strengthen your most important relationships, your marriage, your family. But honestly, it can even strengthen your other relationships. But if you don't say those words in their absence, it can hurt. It can devastate those relationships. It's destructive when when we withhold those words from others. Why? Because unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude. You guys getting this? Here's another quote. This is from uh, William Arthur Ward. He says, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. How silly is that, you know, to go out and buy your friend a present, wrap it all up, and then stick it under your bed and forget about it? Like, you're so excited for that gift, but you never give that gift? I don't even think you get credit when you say, you know, it's the thought that counts. I I mean, that's like... But... (laughs) What good is it? What value does it have if you never give the gift? And listen, gratitude is only redeemed when you express it. So is there anybody you're withholding gratitude from? I mean, think about it. Maybe intentionally, unintentionally. Is there anybody you're withholding gratitude from? Withholding the expression because gratitude must be expressed to exist. That leads me to the second practice. So the bottom list there, second practice, practice to do at the bottom of your notes. Number two, improve your gratitude reflex. Improve your gratitude reflex. What's a reflex? Well, it's the spontaneous thing. It's this automatic reaction, right? So a gratitude reflex is the ability to spontaneously respond with gratitude, to simply say, thank you. Thank you. I, I thought about, how about we just practice in the sermon? Like, like, I'll count to three, and then just say the words, thank you. I think maybe it would be good. Let's just practice saying it out loud, all right? Ready? One, two, three, thank you. Oh, man, you guys are really good. You guys are good at this. Maybe you don't need this sermon. Uh, you guys did really well. All right. Be ready to say thank you. Be ready quick to say thank you. And let me just say this. Say thank you when you feel it, and maybe say thank you when you don't feel it. I mean, there's times you feel gratitude, you want to say thank you, and you're like, yes, thank you. But there's times that you know you should, but you just don't feel it. I won't give you an example. I'll let you just think about your own life. There's probably an example that you can maybe think of, times when you're not sure, right? It's great to feel gratitude. When you feel appreciation, you say thank you, but sometimes you need to say thank you when you don't feel it because it's just the right thing to do. It can strengthen that relationship. And, and when you do say thank you and when you don't feel it, you know, don't worry about it being insincere. I, I mean, I think just saying it is helpful. Don't worry about being thank, uh, a fake. It's just, you know, it's the right thing to do, a kind human being thing to do. And here's something I've learned, and you've probably heard this before, but often right feelings follow right actions. So maybe you just need to muster up the thank you even if you don't feel it, and just see after you do the right actions if the right feelings will follow. All right, I'm going to move on. Gratitude must be expressed to exist, so we need to improve our gratitude reflex. Gratitude is a powerful force in our life because principle number three, gratitude defeats entitlement. Gratitude defeats entitlement. I think we know, but let me just make sure you understand. Entitlement is the thought or belief of a thinking that I deserve this. Somebody owes me something. So it's thoughts like, you know, I deserve this house, this car, this outfit, this promotion. I deserve this opportunity. I deserve these things. I love how football coach Barry Switzer defined entitlement attitude. He said this. He says, 
It's people who are born on third base and think they hit a triple. So in the story about the, the lepers, there's nine who didn't return. And did you catch what it said about the one who did return? I think we breezed over this. So let me just make sure you, you heard this. Verse 16, he says, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him because he was a Samaritan. Now, there's a lot implied by just defining that he is a Samaritan, identifying him as a Samaritan, because you have to understand the culture in these days. In other words, he wasn't, he wasn't Jewish. He wasn't from Israel. He was a Samaritan. He wasn't like everyone else. And I don't know, maybe the other nine were Jewish. We don't know. But it's kind of implying that he was different than the other nine because of his heritage, his culture, where he came from, his lineage. It's implied here. And so could this mean that one who returned was a Samaritan? The others who did and the other nine were maybe Jewish. So the ones that didn't return, maybe they didn't return because maybe they felt entitled. Like, okay, we, we are, we're Jewish, same heritage as of Jesus. We're the chosen special people. We deserve this healing. This is what we have coming to us because of who we are. We're God's special chosen people. We are privileged people, so they didn't return. But this one who did, he was a Samaritan. In this time, in this culture, he would be looked down upon. He was hated by the Jewish people. But Jesus gave him his attention and provided this healing for him. And the Samaritan was humbled by this. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, as if to say, I don't deserve this, but you healed me anyways. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, when you feel entitled to something, it's impossible to be grateful for it. Think about it. If you feel entitled to it, like you deserve that, it's hard to be thankful and grateful for that thing. And it's easy for us to lose sight of how blessed we are, especially as Americans. In the place where we live, we get to enjoy some amazing freedoms and opportunities but also to live in a place with such comfort and prosperity, what we have access to, it's easy for us to forget how much of the world is living in poverty and, 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 and living in, in horrible, struggling in horrible conditions. We just need to have that as a reference point sometimes. We didn't do anything to be born in the United States, to be born on third base, guys. So please remember this as well. To the person who much is given, much is required. We're blessed. Let's not forget that. You know, that, that one man, he may have not expected to get healed that day, but he did. He knew he didn't deserve it. When he was healed, he was so full of gratitude that he took time to return to Jesus, the healer, to express his gratitude. And that leads me to the last point, principle number four. Gratitude opens opportunities. Look at verse 17 again. It says, Jesus asked, where are, the, where are the, all, not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, arise, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The, the, the text here is literally saying your faith has saved you. The Bible is implying that although the other ten were healed, there was only one who was saved. I mean, that's kind of what's saying. Although 10 people experienced physical healing, there was only one that experienced a spiritual healing. And that one person was the one who came back and he received salvation and the healing of his soul. That difference was he was the one person who came back and said, thank you. So when you go back and you say thank you to God, it positions you for the more that God wants to do. I, 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 I want to make sure you guys understand this. We want to be thankful, grateful people for a lot of reasons, but I, I, I don't want us to lose the sight of the fact that I think our posture, our heart of gratitude opens up the door. It provides the opportunity for the more that God wants to do. He wants to bless us. He wants to, he wants to pour out his, his love, his spirit on us. He wants to do all those things. And it just makes me wonder how many times in my life I've missed out on the more that God wants to do because I didn't come back and say thank you. I wonder how many times I've missed receiving his blessings because I've taken things for granted when God actually wanted to do more. God wants to do more. He wants to, he wants to deepen our relationship with him, our connection with him. He wants to strengthen our most important relationships, you know, our marriage, our children, our parents. He wants to build and reinforce our bond with our friends. He wants to help you in the workplace, in the classroom. He wants to grant you more influence and more opportunities. 
He wants you to make a bigger influence in this world. But we miss out when we don't go back and say thank you. Being grateful is what positions us for the more that God wants to do. For the miracles he wants to perform. The miracles he wants to perform. I was thinking about it. If you read back through the Gospels and you're just looking for this simple act of thankfulness, gratitude, it's amazing how, how many times thanksgiving or, or thanks is expressed and then immediately uh, it's, uh, a miracle follows behind it. Um, you know, for example, feeding of the 5,000. Jesus, he, he gives thanks for the loaves and fishes. And then what happens the very next thing is it's multiplied, right? Oftentimes, if you're looking for it, you can see there is a thanksgiving that's offered before a miracle happens. Yes, we need to be thankful after the miracle comes, but I just wonder if we need to be thankful a little bit before the miracle comes, too. Hmm. Again, gratitude positions you for the more that God wants to do. And so, before we leave this morning, I want us to spend a few more minutes in worship. I know we worship for a little bit, thanks to Ben and the team, but I want us to spend a few more minutes worshiping together. As we end service, praise and worship is a way that we can express our gratitude to God. It's an easy way to do that. Express our gratitude, our thankfulness for who he is and what he's done. So before we worship, though, let me just ask you a few questions. Just kind of rehashing what we talked about a little bit this morning. But I want you to think about the gratitude gap for a moment. The space between gratitude felt and gratitude expressed in your life. You know, maybe you think you're a grateful person, but do you always do a good job expressing it? What if, what if, what if you need to do more in expressing that gratitude? I know I've felt challenged to do that more. Maybe you need to develop a gratitude routine. Maybe that question I ask about, is there anybody you're withholding gratitude from? Maybe you need to consider that. Maybe there's some conviction there. The Lord's trying to uh, help you with that. Some some gratitude that needs to be expressed. Because remember, unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude, right? Is there someone you need to thank and appreciate? How about this? How's your gratitude reflex? Maybe you need to tell the boss, a coworker, a teacher, thank you. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your children, a parent, a sibling. Is God leading you to go back and say thank you to someone? And maybe... Maybe this, this gratitude thing is difficult for you because of that whole entitlement attitude you may be battling. So maybe the Holy Spirit just needs to work on you in that. You know, maybe you think you deserve what you have and you still have more coming to you, right? That's kind of your attitude in life. But the Holy Spirit is convicting you that maybe you just need to ask for forgiveness for that attitude and go back and say thanks to some people, including thanks to God. I want us to be grateful people. So can we just, as we end here, we're going to worship, but also will you just allow the Holy Spirit to work inside of you a little bit as he continues to refine all of us to be more like Jesus. So would you stand with me? Yeah. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just start by saying thank you. <laughs> it seems appropriate to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace that was demonstrated to us by giving of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving your son, the one who can come and cleanse us and heal us, make us whole. Lord, if nothing else good happened to us, but just that we receive salvation, we would be the blessed of all people. Like, wow, that's amazing. We just thank you for salvation, God. Opportunity for relationship with you. God, thank you for loving us, even when we are ungrateful. And God, I just uh, pray right now that your Holy Spirit would stir up and lead us to new levels of gratitude in our lives. I, I pray that we'd have the courage to express it. And God, I just, I believe, I, I believe, I pray, I've been praying all day that, Lord, through our expressions of gratitude, that you would bring healing to relationships. That, God, just the simple expression of, of thankfulness and gratitude could heal marriages. It could, it could heal relationships with parents. It could increase influence in people's lives at work, at school. It could give new opportunities as we are grateful people, God, that it positions us for the more that you have for us. God, that there's miracles you want to do because of our, our thankfulness. So, Lord, teach us. Teach us to be thankful. 
And God, again, we want it to be more than just something we feel on the inside, but God, let us be able to express it with our lives and with our words, with our actions. And Jesus, we're believing that you can and you will do exceedingly more than we can think or imagine. So God, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful to you, grateful to others. And God, I just pray that we, we just rise up and we walk in the freedom and the joy and the contentment and the satisfaction that comes when we close that gap, <laughs> that gratitude gap. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, let's take a few minutes. All my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing song as I often do every song I stand and you never do oh, so I throw up my hands praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So come on my soul, oh don't you 